Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, this is your host, Gabe Al-Romani. Alhamdulillah, you're joining us today with another very important and interesting topic that we are discussing, inshallah, to help you as the Muslim, wherever you might be in the world right now, to connect more with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to, bi'idhnillah, become a better Muslim and a more productive Muslim. In our previous episode, we discussed the importance of the masjid in the Muslim's life. And today we're going to continue with that, bi'idhnillah. And as always, I'm joined by my dear respected brothers and teachers, Sheikh Salim Amri, yeah, Sheikh Hassan Al-Hakim, and Dr. Ahmed Ibn Saifuddin. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. In our previous episode, we talked about the history of the masjid, and we talked about the importance or the role of the masjid in the community. And we said that it has a spiritual dimension, of course, a social dimension, and knowledge dimension, which is very important. I wanted to ask or to comment a little bit more on one important topic, and that is the women and their responsibility towards the masjid, or what can they do, what can they not do. And I want to just say here that this is an issue around the world. In the West, it's also an issue, because you know you might feel that in the West it's a bit more free. But I found from my travels that it's a bit confusing because, for example, in some Arab countries, you have, mashallah, places dedicated for women. In some uh, Western countries, you don't have that, right? But then you find that even though there's places dedicated for women here, women don't come in the Muslim countries. And women in the West, they want to come, but they don't have places. So, uh, Sheikh Hassan, would you like to comment a little bit more on this? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa alihi wa sahbihi man ahtada bi hudahu amma ba'd. We have to first look at what Islam says, hmm. and then balance. Praying in the masjid is not a cultural thing. This was, at the time of the Prophet wassalam, an obligation upon men who were Muslim and free of obstacles, such as traveling, illness, excuses that we may come to talk about that prevent you from entering the masjid. Women, on the other hand, the Prophet said wassalam, in the Sahih Hadith, authentic Hadith, the Prophet told us, do not prevent the female servants of Allah from attending the houses of Allah, that is the masajid. And he said in another hadith, وَبُيُوتُهُنَّ خَيْرٌ لَهُنَّ And their homes are better for them. So the Prophet is saying, it's a no-no for a man to prevent his wife, daughter, mother, sister from attending a masjid, unless there is another external legitimate right, right. excuse that would entitle him to do so. But in normal conditions, the masjid is next to her home and it's safe and there's nothing wrong with her attire or the way she's going out. And she wants to go, you have no permission or right to prevent her. Let her go. Yet the Prophet is balancing and saying, by the way, if you're going for the reward, O oh sister in Islam, remaining in your home, is much rewardable for you. And this is, first of all, to take off the burden from their backs. And secondly, to reduce any possibility of temptation or anything that might harm the woman, either physically or her reputation. So Islam is looking at the bigger picture rather than the smaller one, knowing that the wives of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to pray in the masjid. Mm. So they acknowledged the fact, but sometimes a woman says, I'd love to listen to the Imam. Okay, it's more rewarding to pray in your home. She says, I know, but I want to go and pray in the masjid. No problem, it's permissible, it's halal. Now, if you have this balance, let's go and look at our countries. Arab countries have a separate section of the masjid, totally separate. Mm. And this is something okay. This is something nice. I feel safe when my wife goes there or my daughter goes there. They're secluded from men. The men cannot see them. Men cannot harass them for any other reason. They can take their freedom and pray as they wish. But in some countries, as in the, if you stayed in the West, maybe they don't have the luxury of dedicating a place for women. So they tend not to allocate 
And this is the way that the Prophet's masjid was. So why go to extreme and say, no, if there is no allocated place for women's section, then she shouldn't go. This is totally wrong. The masjid is a masjid. And the rows that had no partition at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. And there were no curtains. It was a well-established fact. Men at the front, women at the back. Men must not, after the end of the prayer, stand up and look because the women may not be properly covered as they wish. So you have to pause for a while until the women after the salah can cover if they want to cover or, or take care of themselves. And then you can leave as men. This is the etiquette. So if there isn't an allocated place or section for women, this doesn't mean that a woman cannot enter a masjid that doesn't have a section of women. Mm. She can enter the masjid and pray at the end of the masjid. However, when you go a step further, you'd find some people that have taken the freedom to have all this mixing <laughs> among men and women in the masjid. And the masjid has become, a'udhu billah, like a club. It's not a masjid anymore. Yes, I'd like to see women, particularly in Muslims and non-Muslim countries in particular, they need the masjid to give them more of a nourishment, pass on the knowledge. They find themselves among their own brothers and sisters as a community. That's important. However, you need to have these limits set for mixing, free mixing between men and women. If it's just a passing by or although, it's always preferable to have their own separate entrance, separate section, that would make everything decent and free of any uh, problems. The worst is the reaction of some so-called Muslims. I don't know where they got the idea of uh, praying together, men and women, side by which side, is or... side by side, and even going a step further, assigning a woman to lead the prayer. Yeah. Where are they going? I mean, where did they get this from? When Allah assigns these roles, we have to adhere and say, Sami'na wa ata'na. We've accepted and we are obeying. You cannot change the rules because we need to look progressive. We need to look modern. We need to look like an equal footing between men and women. This is not the idea. This is not how it works. And we need to be very, very careful. Yes, we need to allow women when they are interested in or there is some benefits which are present. I think there are some benefits for women. As I said, you can find them in the malls. You can find them in the shopping centers, the streets, going anywhere. However, when it comes to masjid, you say, well, I don't want them to come to the masjid. Yes, well, give them the opportunity if they love to, as Sheikh Mashallah has explained, if there is nothing to you know, prevent them from coming. However, we need to be very, very careful how we have the men and women sitting together. And I think, alhamdulillah, in many Muslim countries, in many Muslim societies around the world, the masjid is doing a good help for the Muslim community to be very, very close to each other. Mashallah. Anyone would like to comment on this? Yes, yes, before we go further. The hadith, لا تمنعوا إما الله مساجد الله Do not stop the female servant from the houses of Allah. Aisha radiallahu anha, commented, she said, had the Prophet ﷺ seen the women at her time after his departure, he would have stopped them. Abu Huraira, when a woman passed by him and he smelled the fragrance, the perfume, said, Ila aina ya amat al -jabbar. Where are you heading to, O servant of the Almighty? He said to the Masjid, he said, go back and take ghusl like Yanaba. Okay. So if the sister, they are going to the Masjid, they should respect the house of Allah. No perfume, no free mingling. I emphasize on this. The, the Sahabiyat used to pray in the masjid, but there's no free mixing. Sahaba would pray, remain seated until the Prophet ﷺ feels that every woman reaches her home. And he allocated for them a special door. Now, coming to the masjid, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, خير بقاع الأرض المساجد وشرها الأسواق. As in Ibn Hibban and it's authentic hadith. The best places on earth, patches on earth, are oh, the masajids. The most beloved, yes. The masajids. Yes. خير بقاع الأرض. And the worst are the markets. 
Whom do you find in the masajid? The malaika. Praying for you as long as you are there. Who is there in the market? Shaitan. Shaitan planting his flag. And you find the majority of the people are in the markets. And the adhan is going on. And they don't go to the masjid. Regarding the merit of building masjids mm. for the sake of Allah. Man bana lillahi masjidan walaw kana kamif hasi qatatah. Bana Allah lahu baytan fil jannah. Whoever builds for Allah a masjid, even if it is the size of the ground nest of the sand grouse, the sand grouse is a bird, Allah will build for him a house in the Jannah. Subhanallah. If it is that small masjid can accommodate 10, 20, as Sheikh Asa mentioned, the price of the chandelier can build many masjids in many Muslim countries, many masjids, only that. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying, even it is in the size of the mifhas qata, the size of the sand grouse. So the merit of the masjid, the role of the masjid, what should be there in the masjid, where are the study circles in the masjid? The masjids were universities in the past. Universities. All these universities famous today, Al-Azhar, Al-Qairawan, they were masajids. In Spain, the masajids were universities, where all the different disciplines of knowledge were taught. So that's what we need to revive. The ummah has to revive that. It is also the place, the masjid, at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Even the Abyssinians, we all know the hadith, used to entertain and play with their spears in the masjid. MashaAllah. May Allah give us the understanding. I mean, Ability to build some masjid, inshallah, bidnillah. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this. God is great. A friendly message by Dr. Zakir. Old Age Home. Al-Quran, Surah Al-Isra. Chapter number 17, verses number 23 and 24 says, Your Lord has decreed that you worship none but Him and that you be kind to parents. Whether one or both of them attain old age in your life, say not a word of contempt. Do not say off to them, nor repel them, but address them in terms of honor. And out of kindness, lower to them the wing of humility and say, My Lord, bestow on them your mercy even as they cherished me in childhood. There is no place for old age in Islam. Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Peace TV presents over 100 million viewers at one of the largest peace conferences in the world, addressing a sea of spellbound spectators over 30 world-renowned orators on Islam with credentials impeccable. The truth of Islam. Deen is your way of life. It is our duty, our obligation. By following the Quran and Sunnah, we will give the message to one and all. To one and all. With articulation exquisite. Read the book of Allah. Islam is the easy way. It's the simple way. Remind each other. The Muslim is not a source of harm for other people. Collaborate with the people for good. This is the call of Islam. Is with the mission of spreading the truth of Islam. Do what you can to spread the word of Islam. Wherever we are, live like Muslims. Use your power. Allah is saying, why do you need anything else? This Quran is self-sufficient. The only book on the face of the globe, the Quran. How a human being should lead his life is given in this instruction manual, the glorious Quran. The glorious Quran. For peace to prevail on earth in peacemakers, Next on Peace TV. God is great. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. And just before the break, we're talking about the importance of the masjid. And Sheikh Salim was talking about building masjid and the virtues of building this masjid and the rewards that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will build for them a house in Jannah. 
even if this masjid is something very small in this world. I want to just some clarification here, Sheikh. Building a masjid here, does it mean building the whole masjid by itself, or can someone contribute a little bit? You know, it could be a small amount, or how, how does it work? Any? Even by contributing. I remember our Sheikh Nasr, Rahimahullah al Albani, there was one approached him and he said, Do we want to build a masjid? And he gave him what he could pay. And he told him, I want it in the foundation. Use that money for the foundation, not for the decoration. Okay? He's very careful. Yeah, in the foundation. So, yes, by contributing, yes. So anything uh, you can give, yes, yes, it's yes. still, you will still share See, in that reward, inshallah. Brothers and sisters, whom you are dealing with? Al Ghani. Al Ghani, inshallah. The most generous. Most generous. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is what you are capable to do. I'd like to go to uh, the issue of the rewards for the praying people. Now, if we say there is a reward for building the masjid, those who attend will have a greater reward when praying in the masjid in congregation instead of just praying alone. In the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Salatu al-jama'ati tafdulu salat al-fadhi aw al-fard bi sab'in wa ishni daraja. So the congregational prayer is higher and 27 times more than if you pray alone. So if you pray by yourself, you'll have only one reward, or even if you pray in the house. And there is a problem with people who just neglect not only this so much virtue and reward-winning opportunity, they find excuses not to come to the masjid. They say, well, some scholars said that it's just only a sunnah, it's not right. Well, if you hear the adhan, look at the story of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu. When he was living far away from the masjid, and he was a blind man, and then it was difficult because at the time of the Prophet وسلم, the roads of Medina were not very much paved and well maintained. There were probably ditches, palm trees, thorns on the way. It was not a time safe. Maybe uh, wild animals could roam around, particularly at night. And then that man came to the Prophet وسلم, and he said, I'm a blind man. Would it be permissible for me not to pray in the masjid? The Prophet ﷺ said, well, I can see your excuse. You're excused. And then he went. But he called him again. And he said, do you hear the adhan? He said, yes. He said, then you have to answer. I would not find an excuse for you. Look at this situation. A blind man who may not have someone to guide him. That's why they said in the seerah that Abdullah ibn Maktoum anhu made that rope from his house to know. the masjid just to hold on to, to lead him to the masjid. Now we have people, mashallah, with great health, macho looking, mashallah, they have this full-fledged well-being, and yet they're not willing to come and save from their time to the masjid. That's an enrichment to their heart, and Allah will give them rewards, and it's going to be built for them for the hereafter. So you'd be wondering, why are they losing these opportunities? Only the shaitan that's just holding them to stay in, in the houses. And particularly when people, during Ramadan, when it's an opportunity for Muslims to come and be in the congregation and pray with the imam. The Prophet ﷺ said, مَنْ صَلَّ الْعِشَاءَ فِي جَمَاعَةً فَكَأَنَّمَا قَامَ نِصْفَ اللَّيْلِ وَمَنْ صَلَّ الْفَجْرَ فِي جَمَاعَةً فَكَأَنَّمَا قَامَ اللَّيْلَ كُلَّهِ if you pray in congregation, meaning in the masjid, it's just like you have stood up in prayer half of the night. But if you pray even fajr, it's just like you have stood in prayer all night long. Now we have this, if you cannot at least come to any taraweeh prayer or tahajjud prayer for your particular reason, at least do not miss the obligatory prayer, particularly isha and fajr, where people tend to be lazy, they came after work tired and so on, or at Fajr time, you have to wake up and get prepared and go to the masjid. It takes little effort, but then the reward is so great. Mashallah, I just wanted to uh, remind me of an interesting show I've seen recently about tying a rope to the masjid. 
the story of Abdullah ibn Maktoum radiallahu anhu. There was a, a blind man in Palestine. Just recently, you know, and I think he took the story from, or the, uh, the inspiration from this story. And the same thing, you know, this man, mashallah, he tied a rope to the masjid door and all the way to his house. And he goes to the masjid for all the five daily prayers. And he's blind. He's in Palestine, subhanAllah. And another thing that I've witnessed myself, where my father-in-law lives, there are these brothers who, subhanAllah, and Allah has tested them. They are handicapped. There are three brothers. And every time I go there and I spend a day or two for all the salawat, I see these brothers in the masjid, including Fajr. And when you look at them, subhanAllah, almost that should feel sorry for them. But then when you think about it, you feel sorry more for the people who are not coming to the masjid than you feel for these, you know, these brothers. You say, mashallah, you know, these, and when you talk to them and mashallah, and their iman is just amazing. And they're, every salah they're there, subhanAllah. I believe there's a special thing for the person who prays fajr in the masjid. Is that true, Sheikh Hassan? As Sheikh Ahmed mentioned, the hadith is a Muslim, that whoever prays fajr as if he has prayed the whole night if you join it with Isha. Hmm. And if you extend this a bit, there is something called Salatul Ishraq. Hmm. And this is where the Prophet says, some, whoever prays in a masjid, the Fajr in congregation, and then remains in his place making dhikr or reciting the Quran or anything that is involving the mentioning of Allah Azza wa Jal and remembering Allah Azza wa Jal hmm. until the sun rises, that's approximately 15 minutes after sunrise, and then he prays two rak'ahs. Hmm. Then Allah Azza wa Jal would register to him the reward of a hajj and umrah. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Tamma, tam. This is, you know, mind-blowing of so much reward in less than an hour and 15 minutes that hmm. you Allah. spend in remembering Allah, Allah cleansing Allah. your heart. That's a great thing to mention. There's a hadith, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but isn't it? Man um, fajr fi masjid or fi jama'ah. Fi dhimmatillah. Yes. Also, this is another hadith that whoever prays al-fajr, hmm. then he is in the safekeeping of Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Prophet is saying that Salah beware Salah. of betraying Allah's protection Allah to that Allah. individual. Allah. And some of the tyrants used to ask those whom they wanted to punish or torture or execute if they had prayed fajr and they say yes, then said, well, you're protected. It's like antivirus. <laughs> eh? You're protected. I cannot do anything to you. Masjid is, as stated before, a center for Muslims. Look at the Somali refugees or the Somali migrants. They have extreme, excellent work for their community by building a masjid. The Turks in Europe, the minute they go and work, they build a masjid, mashallah. The Bengalis in East London, for example, the greatest and biggest, it is a center of unity. And this is why the enemies of Islam try to demolish, to stop. And you find that this is their trend. The first thing they do is bombard a masjid because they know the effect of it. Now, the way I see it, you can infiltrate the Muslims through two ways. Either demolish or destroy the infrastructure of the masjid. Some of them have a woman imam, a woman mu'adhin. I saw a clip. And I said, whoa, <laughs> this is what we're talking about. This is business. And they're praying side by side. And I could imagine the man's praying, saying, Allahu Akbar. <laughs> and I'm waiting for the one next to me to make sujood. And, and, and then this destroys the message of Islam and the role of the message and the salah. On the other hand, Allah Azza wa described to us those who are known to be hypocrites. They pray. But when they go to pray, they are lazy. Mm. They don't remember Allah a lot. Now, what about the vast majority of Muslims? In Fajr, we don't see them. In Dhuhr, we don't see them. In Jum'ah, the masjid is fully packed. Subhan and half of the Muslims are in their houses. But, okay, where were these people at Fajr, Fajr time? time? The same day, Ali. So this is what shaitan is striving to do. He's striving to get Muslims out of the masjid. Go anywhere, to the club, to the stadium, to the souks. And this is... Unfortunately, a big problem, but the time does not allow us to We're going to continue, inshallah, with this. These are very important points that we're making. Inshallah, I hope that you're following with us. And you can always uh, look at some of the previous recordings and follow up with uh, our discussion. We'll see you next time in another episode. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.